Hello, I'm Tom Washbourne, Knowledge Exchange Manager for AHDB, and thanks very much for joining us for today's webinar. Throughout, you know, throughout November, we're focusing on pneumonia with webinars on many different aspects of the disease, which is not only a major issue for young stock, but also massively disheartening for the teams involved with calf rearing on farm. Today's focus is on immunity, and more specifically on the role stress management and vaccinations play within your pneumonia toolkit. I'm joined by Nick Given from Belmont Farm and Equine Vets and Kat Baxter-Smith from MSD. Hi both. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you. So we will we'll come back to you for a bit more of an introduction in a moment, but for now I'd just like to run through some housekeeping. Um, everybody is muted, so we won't have any issues with sound interference. We are recording this webinar, and that will be made available for you to watch on YouTube. Um, you'll also find the previous recordings for all other a AHDB webinars, including all of those from the Eumonia series. So if you've missed any or want to go back to check those, then they should be on there shortly. For those of you that are listening to this on YouTube, then please hit the subscribe button for more from AHDB and also follow us on social media, especially on our new Instagram account. There'll be an email sent to everybody who has registered for this webinar with any resources that we might mention tonight, today. And I encourage you to complete the survey along with this to help improve our future events. For those of you who got in quickly to register for the webinar, you might have received a delegate pack in the post, including a shed thermometer, a calf thermometer, our new young stock housing guide, and a calf scorecard. If you didn't receive one of these packs, but would like one of those guides or the scorecard, then those can be ordered via our website. Um, as we go through tonight, it would be great to have as many questions as we can from you. Um, put those in the in the question box. There's a orange arrow. Um, and if you scroll through your slides, there should be some instructions for this. Um, so if you pull out that orange arrow, you can put your questions in there. The questions are anonymous, so you won't be able to see other people's questions. So feel free to ask questions no matter how silly they may seem. With that in mind, I think it'd be good to introduce our panelists for today. So Nick, would you mind giving us an introduction? Um, hi, so um, welcome everybody. Um, can we just do a bit of technical? This is all, everybody can see this, can they? Yes. Yeah, they've, we've gone through to a slide with a picture of Kat and I. Yes. Fantastic. Um, so I'm a um, production animal vet. Um, I work in Herefordshire. Um, so we're based in Hereford and then we cover the surrounding counties as well. And we deal with a broad range of different types of systems. And I focus quite a lot on um, dairy and then beef from dairy calf rearing systems. Um, and we're so lucky to have such a huge number of calves reared in this part of the world that we get exposure. Um, to lots and lots of calves in rear um, and I qualified 14 years ago and I've done the DBR which is a master's in um, in, in bovine reproduction so I'm focusing all my time on cattle um, and very kindly Tom asked if I would um, put something together for for this holistic pneumonia series. Thank you Kat? Nick. Hi yeah uh, I'm Kat Baxter-Smith I'm uh, also a vet but uh, well, I worked in practice for about seven years after graduating in 2010 um, and I've been working as a veterinary advisor for MSD Animal Health for about five years um, and sort of similar to Nick my interest is really cattle young stock particularly um, bovine respiratory disease and pneumonia um, and I have a, a very specific interest in thoracic ultrasound in, in lungs as well so uh, that's me. Thank you both. Um, Nick do you want to take us through what we're going to be covering today? So um, as part of the holistic um, control of bovine respiratory disease, we, Kat and I, are going to cover um, a piece that perhaps doesn't get enough airtime, which is trying to give farmers and people that are watching a bit of an understanding or a bit more of an understanding about um, calf immunity and how the stresses that we put calves under um, impact upon that immunity and then how vaccination uh, works and 
and how that fits in 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 the rearing of calves, beef calves or heifers, um, and just trying to make sure that people get the most out of it if they're doing it. Um, yeah, so we're just trying to fill in the gaps really around the other the other sections that have been covered and will be covered. Um, and so we're going to talk about stress, what it is, um, talk about the interaction, and then Kat's going to cover off at the end about vaccination. Fantastic. Take it away. Okay. So I hope uh, you know this series of webinars is building a um, uh, a picture of the complexity of bovine respiratory disease. Um, we're probably going to recap a couple of things that people may have already seen. Um, three things um, largely come together to make um, healthy calves. Um, this applies to all diseases, in fact, um, and it can be explained um, by the environment that the animal lives in, um, the immunity of that host, and then and in an ideal world, the absence of pathogens or absence of bugs. So a good environment allows a healthy animal in the absence of pathogens to be disease free. So we're aiming as much as we can to fulfill those three, um, those three criteria. You've already had a good, um, a, a good session with Jamie Robertson and, and we'll, we'll have heard lots about um, providing good environments. So we're not going to cover too much of that. We will talk, talk a little bit about how um, the environment creates stress on that animal um, rather than optimal environment. Um, keeping, uh, uh, we're going to talk mostly about this immune system and trying to enhance this immune system or optimize this immune system. And then absence of pathogens is, is is about control of infectious disease in terms of buying infectious diseases in or the hygiene levels that we need to achieve in order to minimize what, you know, those pathogens. So we're really gonna cover off this strong immunity piece here. And this diagram here with the interaction with environment, disease and host is gonna appear quite a few times because it's, it's actually, you know, it's a key part of those three, um, that puzzle. So, because bovine respiratory disease is, um, is a complex condition, it isn't a simple matter of uh, we have presence of virus and this disease, yes or no. Um, and so when we're talking about preventing it, and this is a good slide that Katz provided from MSD, we talk about um, multimodal disease prevention. So controlling one part of the risk factors is, is, is never going to um, be effective in terms of controlling disease and so we need to apply lots of different um, methods of control to reduce disease and often even in you know in spite of everybody's best efforts it's very difficult to get our pneumonia incidence um, down to zero we're always going to have some um, what we term as vectors morbidity so that's some disease and and it's it's because of that complexity um, so you can take away various risk factors and others will, will still be present and therefore you'll get some. You will get less and it's possible to get less and it's possible to have good results, um, but it isn't, uh, you can't just concentrate on one thing. And this diagram shows how we're trying to boost in an innate immunity. We're trying to boost colostrum and potentially provide um, immunity through vaccination on the top of the line. And then we're also, at the same time, our aims are to improve hygiene, reduce uh, stocking density, reduce concurrent disease, and improve ventilation. So it's, it's, it's multifaceted in terms of control. And then that line across the middle is basically showing, showing how disease, you know, resistance to disease. Um, so that's, why, that's how we have to think about bovine respiratory disease. And that's why immunity and, um, and our piece today is, is an important part of the um, building blocks. So uh, a bit of a background to the immune system, which lots of you will be um, familiar with, I'm sure. Um, the immune system very simply is split, um, and this is an oversimplification, but it's, it's quite useful for, for farmers really to think about this because it, it refers to how we choose to vaccinate. So the immune system is split um, into, um, 
are two very basic levels at the beginning. So that's adaptive immunity, um, which is immune memory, and then innate immunity. And that innate immunity, if we think about that first, is, is simple barriers, it's chemicals um, that, are, that are produced by the body to act against invaders, and it's cells that sit um, like guards, basically, waiting to respond. And these, these cells, these chemicals and these barriers are very nonspecific. So they defend the body against attack without necessarily knowing what they're attacking against. Now that innate immune system is really, really important for little calves. Um, and those little calves are born with, uh, as, as those little calves are born with relatively little immunity and they are um, dependent upon picking up immunity in colostrum. And after all the years of our knowledge and understanding of colostrum, colostrum is still vitally important in terms of providing that calf with a strong immune system um, and so or, or the ability to mount a strong immune response so colostrum um, is a, a way of providing the calf with um, not only some of the, the things that help the innate immune response but also um, th things that help the adaptive immune response so if we think about that innate immune response as physical barriers and, and frontline soldiers, the adaptive immune response is, um, is much more about memory. So once the body has um, seen that immune response, that innate immune system feeds back and antibodies are created. And we've all heard about antibodies. Antibodies are the immune, immune system's way of recording, memorizing, and then hopefully preventing the same attack from happening again. So colostrum provides some innate protective antibody, and then it also has antibody that pass into the calf, sit in the bloodstream, um, and go to uh, banks of memory in the immune system, which, which are then used uh, going forward to protect. So those are the two basic levels of, um, of immunity. Intranasal vaccines, work to stimulate the majority of the, the time the innate immune response with some adaptive immunity and injectable vaccines generally um, are about memory so that's an explanation why you know those injectable vaccines often need two shots and it takes time for you before you get any immunity if you're using in injectable vaccines is that the body needs to process them it needs to build a bank of memory and then and then it's then it's able to respond to any attack that occurs um, and so what we need to do, in, if we're thinking about that triangle of disease with host and its immune system, environment and pathogen, what we need to do is we need to support calves um, to have a strong natural immune system. And a lot of the things that we do to those calves in rear and a lot of the things that happen on dairy farms, um, uh, rearing heifers, potentially cause quite a lot of stress. And, and with suckler calves, suckler calves are also under stress as well. We shouldn't forget them. So um, we're whittling away at it by performing processes, etc., um, and reducing the immune response. And then in the background with cattle, um, and, and we are seeing less and less BVD, um, which is great news, but in the background, we should always be bearing in mind um, the activity of BVD. Um, BVD works to reduce the immune response. So it's it's a very sneaky sort of virus that that can hide away in that pi animal and it's and its basis of its success are around its ability to do immune modulation and immune and um suppressing immune response so if you have bvd in your calf rearing system or your heifer rearing system then that will be reducing the immune responses of those animals to run-of-the-mill everyday diseases and making them worse so bvd is something that we always need to have in the back of our minds in terms of um, potentially unexplained um, disease and explained disease um, and just being aware and being, you know people should know their status okay so that's a little bit of background basic background to the immune system um, the other thing that I, we were going to talk about um, is stress so what is stress 
So that's de one definition. There's lots of different definitions, but I thought that was quite a good definition. Any event that causes physical, emotional, or psychological strain. Um, so we, and there's a picture of a lion there, because we, I think, often forget that we're dealing with a prey species um, that is designed not to show stress. It's designed not to show um, disease and illness and weakness, because if it reveals itself to be that, then the lion or the wolf is going to pick them off and they you know they've been through a um an evolutionary process that that makes this completely inherent in them and so a lot of the things that we do with our calves are stressful and they may not be necessarily obviously stressful um down to simply handling um that will elevate um cortisol levels um painful processes elevate cortisol levels. Cortisol is the stress hormone. Um, cortisol is designed to, is the physiological um, mechanism to, to assist in what's called the fight or flight response and bring a prey species. They need to be ready to go for flight at any point. And so they have rapid increases in cortisol in response to stresses. And cortisol does things like increase blood glucose. So it makes energy available to the animal to, to then run as fast as it can, as an example. So that's the point of cortisol. Um, and cortisol has the negative effect of reducing the immune response. So cortisol dampens down the activity of um, largely that adaptive immunity we're talking about, that memory immunity. It reduces the activity of the cells that produce antibody and it reduces the activity of the cells that um, that amplify antibody responses. So it, it interferes quite a bit with our injectable vaccines and it interferes quite a bit with, with the memory that that calf has. And in really stressful situations, you see outbreaks of, of neonatal disease or diseases really that calves should have already had and got over, they will come back. Um, so we, you know, those situations, we really look hard at you know, well, why are we having outbreaks of RSV in six month old dairy, dairy calves? There must be some sort of stressor on them for them to have not achieved immunity and for this, this condition to have come back. Um, Nick, so can that's I, what- Can I ask Nick? Yeah. So we know that um, cortisol will reduce the calf's immune response. Over what period of time does that happen? So if, if you perform a stressful procedure on a calf, handling group changes or something along those lines. Do we see it the following day? Is it obvious that our stress has caused that issue? Or so, is there a bit of a time lag? Is it not so obvious the, the stresses that we are putting on these animals, the impact that it actually has on performance? There's a bit of a time lag that not all stress is equal. If it's, if it's sustained, um, so one of the things, um, uh, where are we here? Um, so if it's sustained, let's say it's sustained periods of exposure to cold conditions, um, then the impact upon the immune system is much greater. If it's a one-off, i.e. a handling to be weighed or a handling for a TB test, and it's, it's relatively low stress and nothing then happens after that for a window of time and we'll go on to that later then the the impact upon the immune system is much less so it, it's it's it and and it it happens the the elevation of cortisol happens very very quickly if it's sustained then the impact upon the immune system is greater so if it's just a quick blip there will be an impact but it's not as great as sustained does that make it doesn't really answer your question tom but but it that's how it works um, And as I've said before, the adaptive immune system is most affected by um, these stressors. Um, and that antibody immune response is weakened. And environment can also impact upon um, the immune system. So it, it may be um, uh, there's good evidence that, for example, environmental ammonia will impact upon the um, the protective immunity that the lungs have 
So some of those protective cells that live within the lungs and protect the lungs from and the upper airways from attack are damaged by or they're compromised by um, by high levels of environmental ammonia. So that obviously, you know, that comes from that wet that wet environment that I'm sure has been spoken about. So having high levels of ammonia in the air is really bad. Um, there's also um, good evidence that low temperatures will reduce immune um, the ability of the immune system to function. So calves that are chilled um, in low temperatures in the winter time, particularly, you know, it's it's another piece of the pit puzzle in terms of that the multifaceted um, um, control of bovine respiratory disease. Also, if they've not had enough uh, nutrition, like if they're chronically underfed, that can be uh, predisposing yeah. to pneumonia and other disease. Yeah. Um, so what are the stresses? Um, they're wide and varied. Um, they can be psychological or physical. Um, in suckler calves, let's say, um, weaning is probably the biggest stress that animal is going to come up against in its life. Um, we, you often see um, stress related issues when calf is at foot out in the field and they very commonly result to, um, due to cow problems. So un, un, undisclosed um, cows that have only got one teat, let's say calf isn't getting enough milk at peak requirements um, and then calf comes down with pneumonia in the summertime. And so it does happen and it, there's often an explanation. Um, weather on suckler calves, uh, extreme weather events when they're little, that can cause, that's obviously a stress. Um, and then the environment they go into when they're weaned. And any painful process and disbudding is, is or possibly castration, they, they would all be counted as stresses. Um, any painful process that we do using pain relief um, reduces that, uh, reduces pain and reduces that level of cortisol. So it, it's about that sustained elevated cortisol. If you use pain relief, it reduces that. So therefore the impact upon the immune system will be less. And there's lots of good evidence that, um, that we can reduce pain using not non-steroidals in cattle. Um, beef cross and dairy calves in rear, um, we can't forget that they're, we're moving a, often moving a two to three week old um, beef cross calf from its farm of origin um, to a new place, possibly through a market, um, multiple handlings, transport, big diet change, um, potentially moving on to inadequate diets. And, and then once they're in rear, the same processes are undertaken in terms of being castrated or disbudded. These are all stresses. And if the environment's suboptimal, um, if they're mixed at the wrong time, we're constantly constantly whittling away um you know we're constantly providing them with stresses that will whittle away at their immune system so in terms of those two groups suckler calves versus reared beef cross calves um you can see that the amount of stresses that those reared beef cross calves are exposed to is is much higher than the suckler calves and then that you know nicely corresponds to the levels of um, pneumonia that we'd see in those groups as well um, is in that the suckler calf pneumonia is much, there's much less of them, um, whereas the rear beef cross dairy calves they're under so much more strain, um, and for a couple of other factors that they they, they will succumb um, more frequently. So lots of things were, are um, creating stress. Handling um, for any reason is is a psychological stressor. And then the, the other things, some of those are a bit more obvious. We're going to touch on a lot of these stresses like inadequate diet now. Um, uh, we won't touch on all of them, um, but they all have uh, a part to play. So this is a good diagram um, that uh, I've taken from a presentation that Ginny Sherwin did when she was talking about um, weaning calves uh, in the weaning campaign that we had last year with AHDB and I think it's a really good um, a really good graphic that explains um, to some degree what's going on in relatively simple terms and shows the challenge that these calves are up against. So if we're looking on at, um, at day zero um, the calf is born and it receives um, hopefully receives an adequate amount of colostrum 
from its dam or a replacer, depending on Yoni's policy, et cetera, et cetera, at farm of origin. Now, the calf at that point has got high levels of circulating cortisol because it's been born and birth is a stressful process. And part of getting itself born, um, as part of that, the calf has to have elevated cortisol. It's also got ele elevated estrogen and progesterone, which are fertility hormones from the dam. Um, and cortisol, estrogen, and progesterone all suppress that calf's immune response. They're all immunosuppressants. So that calf is born at day zero, under stress, before we've even started. It's a natural process, um, but it's, it's up against it from the start. So calf receives colostrum, and very quickly, it receives protective antibodies. And those protective antibodies may they're split into two types so they're split into into local antibodies which is our innate immune system that we've talked about and they sit on the surface of um spirit, respiratory tract to some degree but throughout the intestines um and then the other half of the antibodies are absorbed and they go pass into the calf and um they go towards protecting more against respiratory disease and creating some immune memory and the idea with providing that dam's um, colostrum or a cow from that farm's colostrum is that all that immune memory and all those locally protective antibodies are are relative to the diseases that that cow has been exposed to in her life. So things that her herd has, her calf should be protected against. Now those maternal antibodies um, start to wane relatively quickly and they start to drop off um, until uh, fairly steadily um, until around two to three weeks. Uh, about a week old, when all that cortisol and estrogen and progesterone starts to disappear, the calf starts to generate its own antibodies. Its immune system wakes up um, and under the safe protection of the maternal antibodies, it starts to get exposed to the things in its environment, be that E. coli or potentially be that the viruses, the pneumonia viruses. And Nick, just, just before we move on too far, we've got a question come in. If you've got a stressed cow, will that have elevated cortisol levels passed within the milk? Well, the calf is the, the, the levels of cortisol in that. Potentially, yes, but the levels of cortisol in that calf in order to, to go through the birth process are, are so high that it's it's not going to be significant. What, what we worry more about with those cows being under stress around calving or being potentially not fed correctly or going through poor transition um, would be colostrum quality. Um, and we're not going to talk much about the details of colostrum and colostrum quality and things like that today, but um, but inadequate nutrition pre-carving will have a big effect upon um, colostrum quality. And if the farm of origin or the dairy farmer isn't measuring their colostrum before feeding, um, then they potentially won't know about it. So measuring colostrum is is vitally important um so that uh so yeah the maternal antibodies fall off calf ad antibodies start to rise if you imagine that calf received inadequate levels of antibodies so poor quality colostrum then the cover that's given to that animal around day 7 to 14 um may not be sufficient to allow that calf to develop its immune response without having disease and so we have this window of time where that little star is in the middle of that graphic where we've got a bit of a high risk period where that calf's immune system is really on the floor um, and around two to three weeks is is a very popular time to get those calves loaded up into a box and get them to market um, because they're settled on the milk and they're starting to shine and they're doing really well and they're looking great. And, and this is, is, is a really challenging time to be starting moving calves around. It's optimum time for price for the buyer and it's optimum time for the person that's, um, that's produced the calf because they then haven't got to feed it when it's consuming more. So the economics of it is three weeks is, is a good place. Um, whereas for the calf itself, it's potentially, um, is opening that calf up to, to challenges. Um, and then as that calf grows, uh, it develops its immune response further. And then by that you know, eight week period, the calf's 
um, generally pretty robust, should have seen most of the problems that it's going to um, come up against on its farm of origin and should be able to stand most attacks. Um, along the top of that graphic, you've got enteric disease and respiratory disease, and, and those lines show the risk periods. Um, and it's also that's explained by the protective immunity that we give. So a lot of the maternal, um, the local antibody given it with um, colostrum acts locally against enteric disease. So it, it's designed to cover that first seven day period. Um, and then the, the absorbed antibody that's given with colostrum covers that respiratory disease period. So um, there is method in the madness of colostrum feeding and it is a vitally, it's still a vitally important part of um, calf immunity. So Nick, one question has yeah. come in based on, on that time frame. So uh, what age should you move calves from individual pens into automatic calf feeders in group pens? I move them around day 10 stroke 12 as their immunity is heading to its lowest? Uh, so a move for um, a, a baby calf is considerably less stressful than it is when that calf is more mature. Um, so moving them younger is, is a positive thing. Moving them around that 14 to 21 day window um, is would I would try and avoid that if possible, but moving them a little bit younger, so seven days of age, um, that calf then is drinking well. We it's almost pretty much outside of its um, window for most diseases except for rotavirus, um, and is a is a sensible time to do it. The key time to do it is making sure that you don't do it 21 days. You know, do it at least 21 days before you wean them. Um, that's that's quite a key window of time um, and that was talked about quite a bit in that weaning campaign. Um, I think th there's also a there is a little bit of a caveat in that if you're um, if you're monitoring colostrum feeding plenty of it seeing relatively neonate little neonatal disease as in first seven ten days of life and you've got all those things in in place then then moving you know mixing them earlier is absolutely fine if you if you can't get in control of those things then you're going to you'd be better off to leave those calves a little bit longer to get them out of that window of rotavirus because otherwise you potentially spread it from calf to calf now calf to calf spread is um, does happen but most rotavirus is picked up when that calf is very very small in the calving pen from from cow feces in the calving pen and then due to poor colostrum feeding practices creates disease. Um, so yeah, there is a bit of a farm specific factor in the answer to that question. Maybe trying um, to reduce the number of times you move them as well. So I know some farms where they, you know, move them from one pen to another pen to another pen. And actually if you can try and streamline that and only move them once at the most or twice if you have to, that that does seem to reduce the stress as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then so now underneath some arrows have appeared um, or some lightning bolts um, and these are just examples of um, the sort of processes that calves are going through it's um, they don't these things don't have to be done at these inter at these days or anything like that but it's just a, it's just starting getting you guys to think about how how what you're doing on farm relates to this immune system and, and how and when to do things um, I think every time you move them, um that's a psychological stressor so mixing of them the stressor is greater when they're bigger um so we'll talk a little bit about handling later um but um and talk a bit about um, a lady called temple grandin that's done some work with ahtb but she she describes what's called this flight zone um baby calves flight zone is very small you can get very close to a baby calf before it will um before it will move away from you. Whereas calves that are sort of two weeks plus are often quite flighty and take uh, can be more difficult to handle in the pen. And that's because they're um, aware they're vulnerable. But again, coming back to that fight or flight response, they're they are now quicker and therefore they are um, more able to run away from the wolf, the lion or the farmer. Um, so the um, so every time we move them, they have this remixing and rejigging of their hierarchy and 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 strange animals enter into their flight zone and so so 
moving them less, as Kat said, is a positive thing because it's a psychological stress. And movement is is potentially from carving pen into an individual pen, that is stressful. Um, movement from that individual pen into a group, that is stressful. Um, movement in that group from one environment to another, it's a change of environment, that is stressful. Um, other psychological weanings, uh, other psychological um, stresses uh, would be things like uh, weaning, so starting weaning, finishing weaning, um, the calf going through a period of hunger, uh, which if we could optimise it, it wouldn't have that much of a period of hunger, um, but they go through a period of hunger on the whole, and that creates a psychological stress. And, and potentially if that weaning shock is, is too much, um, it could also create a calorie deficit, which is another form of stress on the animal. And then there's those common, um, you know, physical um, painful stresses, um, birth itself, as we've alluded to, and then things like disbudding, castration. So, and it's very hard to tell, to produce a gold standard for this in terms of every farm's um, how to approach things, because farm facilities are different. Pen sizes are different. So if if you if you don't have the facilities to do one move, it, you know you have to think about how you're going to fit that move in in the time scales here. If you've got um, potentially lots of little things and lots of challenges during that pre-weaning period, actually it may be best to push your pre-wean at your weaning your milk phase and delay weaning a couple of weeks so that you can fit one of your extra moves in. That, as I said, that is all very far. Um, Co-mingling or mixing um, is best, as, as somebody asked the question, is, is best done whilst calves are smaller um, and keep it away from um, keep it away from weaning. And then as a rough rule of thumb, we're talking about those spikes in cortisol and the impact on the immune system. If if you keep stresses um, to, to uh, only doing one every seven days, then that will help. Um, so don't wean them, don't sort of uh, disbud them one day and then start weaning a couple of days later and then handle them for a TB test two days later. You're, you're repeatedly handling, you're repeatedly causing stress and those cortisol levels don't get a chance to return to a level that's not going to impact upon that immune system. So keep things generally seven days apart and having a good clear plan on every farm for this milk feeding um calf processes and weaning process dependent upon um, the facilities that you have is a really good idea have it written down sit down and write it with your vet or farm staff or whoever it is that's involved and just make sure everybody knows why we're doing things with seven day intervals and you know why they're spending x amount of time in these pens and x amount of time in these pens um, and your cars will thank you for it um, we talked a bit about handling. So uh, Temple Grandin um, with the AHDB um, did a fantastic, um, she came over I think last year and did a fantastic um, YouTube video and, and series of uh, meetings with AHDB um, about stress-free cattle handling. So looking at handling systems, which isn't as relevant to calves, um, but some of the principles are. Um, some, some, principles on the left I mean these may they're obvious to a lot of people they may not be to others um, don't use sticks move slowly limit sudden noises uh, you know it, shouting and things like that suggests um, that you have uh, as Temple Grandin describes intent so you know you're intending to attack um, solid sides help um, you often see calves move through with gates and hurdles, well, solid sides still apply to them. Um, calves can also be, uh, you know, we could be building races out of hurdles and jamming hurdles in X and Y because they're not particularly heavy. It's often temporary handling facilities, but making sure that there's no sharp edges or angles so that calves don't resent going down um, through shoots and hurdles, um, making sure that crush is positioned. If you're using a little yearling crate or you're using a calf crate, that, that you know they can get into it without knocking themselves. The skin's a lot thinner. They're a lot. They're a lot more tender. They're a neonatal animal, so be gentle with them. Um, and then non-slip flooring. If they want to escape and they're slipping, they're going to be more stressed than if they've got good um, good footing. 
So I'd recommend everybody that's handling cattle watch that um, that webinar with that, that YouTube video with Temple Brandon. So, um, and Kat alluded to this earlier, um, feeding can have a huge impact um, uh, upon the immune system. Um, so, and, and it's all about that nutrient availability. So it's about quality of um, feed that that calf's provided with. Calorie deficits um, are associated with big reductions in, in immune function. And, and it takes less of a calorie deficit in a neonate to cause the same calorie deficit to cause um, the same immune reduction um, as it does in an adult um, because they're rapidly growing. They've got a, a you know, a, they're inefficient in terms of surface area and things like that. So they um, they really are prone to to having calorie deficits. And there's two big areas in our beef, um, beef from dairy calf rearing system that predisposes them to calorie deficits. Um, and that's that movement point at the beginning. So if they go from farm to farm or through a market, um, and it's potentially um, also another one at weaning if that weaning process is is done badly, um, and they're they're not set up to to eat the concentrates that they should be eating uh, at weaning. Um, and in in the dairy system and the dairy heifer production generally, that the biggest calorie deficit period is around the weaning, um, and with practices um, of feeding um, additional milk powder, etc., some farms can struggle to get them to eat the concentrate levels that they need. Um, and but but feeding surplus milk powder certainly is a good thing. Um, so yeah, so there are calorie calorie deficits that these calves are up against. Um, so avoid calorie deficit and then the other things that we need to think about is that we need we do need um, trace elements um, vitamin a and e specifically are really um, heavily involved in the immune response and having a healthy immune system um, so they need to be provided for in the concentrate feed and the milk powder that you're feeding um, so that's something to be aware of um, talking about milk powder I'm sure there'll be other people talking about um, nutrition elsewhere. Um, the milk powder and the milk feeding process is, is, is really important in terms of providing the animal with adequate nutrition. Um, for baby calves, that powder needs to be of high quality milk for the very smallest. Um, and it needs to be that, that when we're talking about quality, we're talking about um, protein and energy levels for baby calves so pro and that protein in the first three to four weeks needs to be heavy on the dairy based protein so skim milk protein ideally um, that's because they can't utilize plant-based protein particularly effectively in the first three to four weeks of life after the first three four three to four weeks of life they start to be able to process some of that plant protein and so then the the, the price of that milk powder can come down um, and provided that it's um, this transitioned effectively, we can you know transition calves onto lower quality milk powder after that three to four weeks. Um, the that three to four weeks window there also however coincides with um, that that dip in immunity. So it would be um, it would be wise to leave them a little bit longer on the high quality protein powder just to get them over that um, that low point. Energy wise, calves need energy, they need calories, especially in the winter. As we've said, uh, cold conditions reduce the immune response. So uh, providing them with additional calories in the winter using higher fat milk powders is a positive thing um, from a health perspective. The milk powder feeding, um, the, the principles need to be, uh, you know, it, it needs to be consistent. Uh, everything needs to be well mixed. Um, presented warm and fresh and we need to have clean equipment um, the uh, you know dirty equipment carries high levels of pathogens the pathogen load and that could be mycoplasma hiding away in biofilm um, or it could just be general bacterial load um, which will have negative impacts upon gut health potentially um, if milk is left lingering and you've got lots of bacteria in it then they will be eating all the goodies before the calf gets the goodies so Hygiene is vitally, vitally important in the milk feeding process and the whole calf feeding process um, for lots of factors. And it, and it is involved in that immune system. Um, and as I said before, but, uh, we can keep banging on about it. Consistency is so important for calf feeding, making sure everybody's mixing the milk at the same temperature 
making sure everybody's feeding the same concentration of milk powder um, so that those calves get the same feed every day and at the same time. Um, it, you know, all those things are, are, um, are really important. Um, there may be a place um, in the future for additional amino acids to be added to milk powders. Um, there is a, a varying body of evidence that some things like protective methionine and lysine may be beneficial for, um, for beef cattle. Um, in and that's about immunity and in terms of um, those limiting um, amino acids in terms of growth. So there might be in the future that you get supplementary amino acids in some of your milk powders. Um, but I just thought I'd put that in as a as another point, really. Concentrate feeds again. Just before we go um, too much from the neck, um, questions come in, which would be quite nice to get both of your opinions on. Actually, um, what are your opinions on adding a perhaps previously sick calf, which is now better, to an established group of calves of similar ages? So pushing the calf back in. With its, yep. the same group or just uh, any group? So I, I'm reading this as an animal which has been sick and put into isolation and now appears better. Um, and if you haven't got your, if you haven't got any other options, what is your opinion on putting that previously sick and now better calf into a group of healthy calves? I'd rather they didn't put it into a group of calves that are younger than it, because that yeah. seems to be a common practice. Um, yeah. If they're going to put it back into any group, it should probably go back into the original group that it was in, rather than going into a, a group of younger calves, because then it's going to likely to infect all of them with whatever it has. So, um, yeah, it's not an ideal practice, but I'd rather it, they did that. <laughs> it doesn't match in. Sorry, you're not matching. You know, it's got to go somewhere, hasn't it? We can't have yeah. um, you know lines of calves living in in individual isolation because they've been sick. And, you know, it's it's. So I'd agree with Pat. It, it, it's got to be. It can't go in with younger calves because most of these um, the common uh, viruses, as an example, will have some degree of carrier state and some degree of shedding, and after the disease, and so you know it presents itself as a uh, as presenting a risk um, to younger calves um, so older calves are a, a better bet or and the same social group if possible and and don't isolate calves where they can't see others so if you've got a calf that's unwell if ideally you need to be able to see other calves um, whilst it's getting to DLC in a pen um, and and also another point actually with isolating calves is the facilities for that calf need to be as good if not better so it needs to have a nice bed, it needs access to feed and water. It can't just be a sort of a, a second, an afterthought, um, because we're not going to get that healthy immune response we need for it to get over disease and, and, and carry on growing. Um, so concentrate feeding will also have an impact upon um, the immune status of the calf. Um, again, it does. It needs to be high quality feed. We're, we are feeding a neonatal animal that ultimately should um, still be consuming big volumes of um, a cow's milk and and it's although we are trying our very best to convert them from being a, a milk drinking um, essentially a monogastric animal to like a like similar to a pig to into into a ruminant um, and we're and we're rushing that process um, whilst we're doing that we need to make sure that, that, that they're provided with high quality protein and um, high quality sources of energy. So that milk powder needs to be high in starch. Um, starch is, is um, generally, so wheat is, 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 is a good example, um, produces a lot of propionate in the rumen and propionate is um, volatile fatty acid that, that creates um, rumen development. So high levels of propionate um, result in, in, in nicely developed rumen surfaces and then, and then the animal is able to ruminate a lot better. If we're feeding lower quality starch sources, we don't get as much propionate. Or if we're, and if we're feeding, you know, if we've got diets that are over dependent upon protein, um, on forage rather than, um, rather than starchy feeds, then we don't get enough um, rumen development. The other thing that's important is the quality of the protein. Um, these, these 
calves haven't got a functioning rumen and they can't effectively digest rumen degradable protein sources very effectively. So you need to feed high quality protein um, that's got um, you know uh, good levels of bypass and high quality bypass protein in them. The soya is is really the go-to in that respect, which is obviously a challenge in terms of um, feeding soya, but it is it is a su very suitable protein source for little calves. Um, and ultimately, if you're going out, you know, buying buying feeds to, to, to feed to calves, you want to get bang for your buck. So, you know, if you're feeding a, a, an 18% um, to a baby calf, you want as much of that protein in the calf as possible. And if it can't digest it, it comes out the other end and potentially causes scour on the way. So it then compromises that calf's ability to absorb, potentially causes dehydration. Um, and your um, valuable 18% nut is largely in the straw. So at any point, you know, if there was one point in this animal's life to focus upon feeding the right, um, the right protein in terms of nitrogen balance, the baby calf is, is a really good place to think about that. Um, yeah, and as I've alluded to, better quality starter will grow better rumens. Um, and then so they'll be weaned and in a much better state. And this this photograph probably been seen before. And if, if people watch the AHDB calf um, weeding campaign last year, you will, you will have seen these. Um, these are the differences in between um, the types of diet that are being fed and the quality of the rumen surface. And you want this this gut diagram on the right for the milk and grain diet is what we need and it's what we're aiming for. Um, whereas with hay in the middle, we haven't had enough propionate. It's high fiber, and we haven't had enough that of that. Um, irritation and, and stimulation of the rumen lining that's required to develop that rumen lining. Um, target concentrates at weaning for an 80 kilo calf, it's a little bit of sums, I mean most people um, wouldn't be achieving what's required, um, so a lot of people might achieve a kilo, maybe two kilos. The um, the amount that's needed for a calf that's on six liters of milk before weaning is actually to replace that those six liters of milk, um, allowing for a consumption of concentrate um, uh, when they've started as well of, of a kilo of half a kilo um, is actually two and a half kilos of concentrate. So they need to be eating two and a half kilos of concentrate per head on the day that the milk is taken away for them to have. Um, to have minimal calorie deficit. Um, and two and a half kilos of concentrates for an 80 kilo calf is quite a lot of feed and very people, very few people achieve it. And that's just, that's purely on the maths of the amount of ME that's provided by a kilo of concentrate versus the amount of ME that's provided by um, two liters of milk. Um, so I would say the take home from that is, is weigh some, weigh some calf cake at weaning and see if we can avoid those, um, the, that calorie deficit at that critical point. Okay, um, so I just want to quickly summarize before I pass over to Kat. Um, so lots of things can cause stress. Don't underestimate um, what the things that we're doing to carbs. Think about when we're doing them in terms of your facilities. Um, and then if you are doing things like disbudding, give pain relief. Um, following the seven day rule. So try to spread them out in, in a way that, that fits. Um, and and as I said, if it means extending your um, milk feeding period a little bit to try and um, to try and reduce those those stresses because of handling, etc., you know, it's well worth doing. Um, optimize nutrition. Make sure that they're fed as well as you can feed them, and then optimize that environment as well. So keeping them warm and and minimizing ammonia levels are really really important. Um, the the thing that we hadn't talked about, sorry to jump around, the thing we hadn't talked about in, in, in so far, we talked a little bit, you guys have heard something about environment, we talked a little bit about environment. We talked a bit about immune system and, and, and how that functions. But what we haven't talked about is, is the, the, the bottom left of that disease triangle, which is the disease agents. Now, the disease agents um, are, are there, they are widespread, um, pretty much, uh, every calf is going to have um, pasturella, manheimia, 
and probably Histophilus living in its living in its upper airways all the time. About 50% of farms in the UK are mycoplasma positive. That's probably a bit more now. Um, and then those viruses are um, RSV is, is very very likely to be endemic on most herds. PI3 will be. IBR it's very widespread. BVD less so, which is great. Um, we're learning more about the others, so we're learning now that coronavirus may be more important, um, and we're learning that um, that the bovine influenza is out there um, and has been implicated in some some disease. We are, we are not sure about the last two at the moment, but but they are present. Um, and we call bovine respiratory disease bovine respiratory disease complex because it's complex. So not no one of those things is going to be involved in baby calf disease. Um, things like IBR will cause adult disease, um, uh, but on the whole, um, you know, it's multifactorial. You've got a virus attacking and weakening the, the, the respiratory system, and then you follow up with those bacteria that are present, um, present in most calves. They make, they make the conditions much worse. Um, so some of them can be mitigated against through hygiene, um, mycoplasma particularly, and, and others we just can't get away from. And in the UK, we have got some vaccines against a lot of them, um, but the, the, the choice is wide and varied, and it will depend on lots of factors depending on your vets and what may be suitable for your farm um, really depends upon the, the process that you're putting your calf through pre-weaning um and then around point of weaning so it's not um it's, you, we may, you may not come away from the second part thinking right i'm going to do x y and z in terms of which vaccines to use but hopefully you'll come away with a bit more of an understanding of of where they fit in and um how how delivering vaccination can help um help you guys so i'm going to pass over to kat Thank you. You you're Kat, also in charge of the slides, Nick. Go, <laughs> yeah. So Kat, just before you go too much further, um, Nick, that was, that was very timely with your wrap up there and your introduction to Kat. But we, we've had a question come in, which Kat, you may well be answering this through the course of your presentation. And if that's the case, then please say so and, and feel free to, to weave it in. Um, with a range of pathogens and a range of vaccines, how do I know which to use on my farm? Yeah, I think we can we can probably address this as we go through if we haven't then we can address it after the vaccine bit yeah because i think um it is a very valid question um so yeah well definitely if we haven't if we haven't really talked about it then we can definitely at the end um okay yes yeah, so uh, i work for as i said before i work for a company that makes uh, vaccines so um a range of pneumonia vaccines as well as others so i spend a lot of my time talking about vaccines and uh helping people use them properly and so some of the things i'm going to talk about are basically uh, what we vac how we vaccinate, how it works, um, and how to get the better use of the, of the vaccines that we are using, um, particularly in the in the case of pneumonia. So uh, this might be basic for some, but it's always good to remind ourselves uh, how vaccines work. The idea is that they are um, a small dose of the, the the virus or bacteria, depending on what you want to vaccinate against, that's generally inactivated or um, rendered in a way so much that it cannot cause disease, but it does expose the animal's uh, immune system to that infection so that it can then learn to uh, fight it off the next time it's exposed to the actual disease. So it, that animal will produce antibodies, they will then float around um, in, in its body and remember that, that that pathogen next time it sees it and, and then can, um, can fight off that disease before it actually causes uh, issues and problems. The, the important thing is that we want to uh, always do the vaccine before we think that the animal is going to be exposed to the issue. So in the case of young calves, uh, as young as possible, because we know that, uh, like Nick said, they've got that particular window of risk when they're a couple of weeks old, and that's when they're most likely to get problems. So if we can vaccinate them either really young in life or even in the case of vaccinating the mums, they get the benefit through the colostrum. Um, we want to get that protection on as, as early as possible in young calves. Um, and then if you have animals where you're seeing disease 
uh, slightly later. So like Nick also, also mentioned around weaning or after weaning or at that three month period, you would want to get your um, protection in before that. And then again, like Nick said, uh, we cannot ignore the good colostrum management and feeding. You know, uh, the vaccine can be as good as, as good as it can be, but no vaccine is good enough to compensate for, for poor management. So if you're going to spend money on vaccination, you want to make sure you're doing everything else uh, as well as you can do as well. Hopefully Nick will pass on the slide. Thank you. Um, so I think this one needs a bit of pressing to get it to, to go up. There we go. This is a, a fun thing that my colleague made. Uh, I quite like it just because it does show us how um, the two things work differently. So on the top uh, line, we have the vaccination. Um, and then on the bottom, we have uh, antibiotics. So we, you know, probably 10 or 15 years ago, we were a lot more reliant and antibiotics were used a lot more freely uh, than they are or, you know, than they are now, because we know now, we now know better. Uh, about the risk of resistance to antibiotics. We're trying to reduce our use of antibiotics. Um, and so it's not really acceptable to be just blanket treating large groups of animals with um, antibiotic products. So in terms of antibiotics, they um, are, you know, they, the animal gets infected, you jab them with the antibiotics, they can kill that bacteria, they don't work against viruses, but they don't give that animal any immune memory. So the animal is susceptible to being infected again. But the idea with vaccination uh, is that you jab the animal before the infection, before the risk. Um, it, um, it ensures that animal then has an immune system that's activated and ready. And so the next time it is exposed to that disease, the immune system is prepared and can fight off that infection. And that, you know, if you keep giving boosters, that will ensure that that keeps, can, keeps working. So it, it's better for the animal because it doesn't need to get sick. Uh, and it's, it is better for you for you long term, uh, rather than having to, to use antibiotics to fight against disease. And, you know, we will always need antibiotics uh, because there will always be animals that get sick. But if we can reserve them for where they're actually needed um, rather than using them as preventative, that is ideal. Sorry. <laughs> My assistant is failing in his duties. <laughs> Maybe, there we go. So uh, this just sort of uh, iterates what I said. The, uh, the, the vaccine primes a healthy animal's immune system to fight off disease. And then there are various different vaccines um, for different diseases, but also vaccines are made in different ways. So you can get vaccines that are live. Um, so normally vaccines that are given like intranasally up the nose um, at the site of, of infection are, are live. Um, and often they only need one dose. Whereas you can also get vaccines that are inactivated um, and, and those need two doses and something called an adjuvant, which will help them to work better. Um, and this little graph just shows uh, why we often uh, need two doses for uh, an inactivated vaccine. Um, and, and that is often because the animal's immune system needs reminding. So um, live vaccines are slightly more potent. Uh, they hang around a bit longer in the body after they're given. And so the animal's immune system has got more time to, to produce that immune response. Um, inactivated vaccines generally need two doses uh, to, to give the animal that initial uh, exposure, uh, produce an immune response and then remind it. And then it produces an even better and stronger, longer lasting immune response um, after that second dose. And that's what we're doing with our boosters as well. So every year, uh, say for IBR, we boost our animals every year. We're, we're giving them that the immune system rem a reminder to say, look, you, you know how to respond to this. Um, here's a little bit of that disease. And the immune system wakes up and goes, oh, yes, I do know. Um, and that means it's ready for, for if IBR infection were to actually come in. Kat, um, yeah. I have naively misunderstood. That sounded to me like live vaccines are more efficient. Why don't we just have live vaccines for everything? Yeah, no, it's a good question. So um, live vaccines are um, so often do work quicker and um, the, but, the, but it depends on how you give them because they may not last as long. So say if we use the example of an intranasal live vaccine for respiratory disease that's given up the nose, that will generally last around three months. Whereas if you give an inactivated vaccine by injection with two doses, 
um, that will often last up to a year, so generally six months to a year. Um, and, it, and it does depend on the disease as well, because some diseases respond better to live vaccines. So if, again, for the example of an intranasal vaccine, we're, we're doing that against um, diseases that are caught by breathing in. So we're, we're protecting the animal where it needs to be protected. But there are um, other infections where actually you need more of an antibody response. So you need a response in the, in the blood in the bloodstream um, and, and you want those antibodies floating around there. Um, and so an inactivated vaccine can actually give a better um, IgG or uh, antibody response in those cases. Um, so, so yes, it, it's on the face of it, some people might think all oh, live is best, but actually it does very much depend on um, the animal you're trying to protect and the disease that you're trying to protect against. And also inactivated vaccines can sometimes be perceived as being safer, say in, if you're using them in pregnancy, et cetera. Um, that's not always the case but um, certainly inactivated vaccines um, may be slightly safer in certain circumstances. Cool, um, on to the next slide. So um, let's look at calf vaccination. Um, what we do know is actually, um, and we always bang on about colostrum, we have already, but calves that have received um, good level or good quality colostrum in the first day of life actually respond better to vaccines that are then given to them. So um, yes, colostrum's got all the benefits that we've already talked about, but also if, if you're vaccinating that animal, um, you're going to get more, more for your money in terms of your vaccination if it's had decent colostrum. Um, so it, it's stimulating that animal's immune system already to be able to respond better um, up to six to ten months of age. Uh, Early life intranasal vaccination, this is becoming very popular now, um, uh, although it's been around for a while and we have more options. Um, but this is very popular in, um, because you can give it to the calf from a day of age in certain circumstances and um, it primes that immune system and then protects them as well in that critical period. So you really want to um, protect the calf prior to challenge, so vaccinate for it as early and as young as possible. Um, and then we have this also the issue of, of MDA, which is maternally derived antibodies. So um, these are the antibodies that the calf gets from the colostrum and they're good, we want them, but what they can do is potentially interfere with some vaccines, normally the injectable ones. So the idea of intranasal vaccination is that because we're giving it to the site that it's needed, we don't get very many maternally derived antibodies on the nasal surface. Um, or in the respiratory tract generally. So we're, we're bypassing that, um, the risk of, of MDA interference. So this is why we can give intranasal vaccines to calves much younger than injectable vaccines. Cool, um, so how it works, I've sort of touched on this a bit. Um, so it, you give it up the nose, intranasal, and it stimulates, uh, when it's first given, it stimulates the non-specific immune system. This is what Nick already described. So we've got our like receptors, cytokines, non-specific immune cells. They're all waiting there in, in the immune system, uh, sorry, in the respiratory system. And they, uh, they respond to the vaccine almost immediately by producing quite a strong non-specific immune response. Um, so this means that uh, that local protection is there very quickly um, and the immune system, the immune cells are ready and, and waiting for, for subsequent infections. And then what happens over a period of a week or two is that the antibodies um, are then started to be produced throughout the body. So uh, the, the, the vaccine virus is taken up by um, little receptor cells, it's, it's taken into the lymph nodes of the animal, it's presented to um, different immune cells and they can start recognising it and producing antibodies. These antibodies then start to grow throughout the body of the animal um, and so that the respiratory tract is protected um, but also that, that means that it, it can have um, more systemic protection and, and protection that lasts for uh, up to three months generally um, in the case of of, of the sort of common uh, respiratory vaccines or maybe longer for, for IBR. So, uh, so what we want is we want that local protection as quick as possible, but then we also want our systemic protection, which comes in after a week or two. Uh, and yeah, the antibodies will, will last in circulation for up to three months uh, in the case of an intranasally given vaccine. So we, we've got a few questions coming in and I think I can group some together. Um, so giving a live vaccine, 
lasting three months, what should you do at three months? Yeah, so basically you need to look at your animals and decide um, how much risk they are in at that point. Um, so it will depend on whether they are at the time of year possibly. So if, the, if, if you gave the, the vaccine during the winter months um, and then it lasts up until turnout and then they get turned out in the summer, there's less risk. If you want to continue to protect them, so maybe they're kept in all the time or they're still going to be in, you really want to get another um, another vaccine protocol on board before the end of that three month period. So you know that three month period is coming to an end. Your options are either to give another intranasal vaccine, which you can do to last another three months, or you could um, actually give a two dose injectable vaccine, um, which would then potentially last up to a year. So um, uh, and, and potentially cover for more pathogens as well. So that would be a good time to this is really why and Nick mentioned this as well. There's, there's so many respiratory vaccines out there. And um, what you want to do is you want to first of all know what is on your farm. So what are the pathogens that you're dealing with? Because there's a, there is a wide range. And then second of all, you want to put in a specific protocol for your animals that's going to cover them for, that, for the early risk period. But then going forward after that as well. So that is not something I can be like, use this vaccine, then this vaccine, because I don't know your farm. You need to um, do some testing, speak to your vet and come up with a protocol that's going to work for you. Thank you. And just just to add to that, um, a comment from someone finding it quite fiddly to administer it intranasally, um, mm. potentially uh, having damages and uh, breaking tips off uh, devices for administering, losing vaccine. It's only a mil, so they end up uh, losing a whole shot. Any tips? That yeah. Good, in yeah, so there's, um, depending on the vaccine you use, there are different options licensed. So um, if I use the example of the vaccine we make, there's a, you can use um, an administration gun. So you can clip the vaccine bottle to the top of the gun. And then we have little nozzles um, and the, the nozzles uh, have a round bit and then a little squirty bit. This is being very specific here. The squirty bit's quite short because I think when, if they're talking about snapping things off, they might be trying to use a, a nozzle that's too long for the animal. So really you want to use a short nozzle, um, potentially with the round bit as well, because that stops you from shoving it too deep in the nose. It doesn't need to go in that deep. Um, and so what I'd also recommend is if, hopefully they're doing it to quite young calves so they're easier to hold under the chin and then you can tilt the head up a little bit and, and put it into the nose that way um, because obviously you don't want them to then put the head down and all drain out so if you can hold the head up so that they don't do that and I would say it sounds like potentially they, they could use a different administration device um, or nozzle because whatever they're using is obviously not working for them. Um, uh, the vaccine we make can also just be given from a syringe. So literally you can get a two mil syringe, take the needle off after mixing it and just give it from the syringe. And some people find that easier as well. I don't know if Nick's got any like in the field tips. <laughs> Putting him on the spot here. No, sorry, I was muted myself. Um, no. <laughs> No, it sounds all it sounds all good, and and we've had similar questions really in terms of losing applicators and it being a fiddly process. Um, just handle them quietly um, it would be a, a something to remember as well. Um, and then the the question before um, the about what vaccine should I use on farm? It is about risk assessment, and it's a risk based decision. So, and there's certain things that people are doing that, that we can identify as presenting high risk. So if you're, for instance, using um, automatic feeders, your risk of mycoplasma is really high compared to using um, like a, a milk bar type setup where potentially you might have one teat for one calf or be able to disinfect teats between calves. And um, so just thinking about how your, your, your calf rearing system is, is the beginnings really of thinking about what you need to prioritize in terms of um in terms of vaccination so yeah, yeah thank you thoughts. i think i've already basically talked about this slide before i showed it because i was 
clearly too excited but uh the yeah this slide just reiterates what i said about maternally derived immunity so we want them to have colostrum we want them to have those antibodies but we just have to consider that impact um that it may have on some vaccines that we can give um a good example actually is bvd vaccine there's there's a, a reason we give bvd vaccines later in life because that is quite highly impacted on by mda so um using an intranasal vaccine really can help to uh, overcome this issue So I think I'm going to move on to optimizing vaccination next. So how do we make sure that, so yeah, I'm not um, pretending these things are cheap. You know, you've invested in a vaccine for your animals. The least we can do then is to um, ensure it's going to work as best as possible. Um, and there are some ways that we can do that. So we want to give it to healthy animals for a start. Giving a vaccine to a sick animal is not generally recommended. Um, so the animal needs to be able to respond to it. Its own immune system needs to be able to respond. Um, like Nick said, good nutrition. Um, you know, it has been a problem in the industry where calves have not been getting enough uh, in terms of milk or milk replacer. And, and their immune system will already be at a compromised level, if that's the case. Uh, the environment, if they're already bat battling cold, damp, you know, again, their immune system will be compromised and they won't be able to respond to the vaccine so well. And stress, as, as we've mentioned, is um, is, is known uh, to, to affect the, the efficacy of vaccination. So trying to manage, um, make sure our animals are basically healthy and, and not stressed uh, to get the best response. So in terms of administration, um, we're going to talk a bit about um, and actually, one this uh, one of the questions. This is this is what the, the picture I should have shown when that question came in because I forgot what I had this slide. But basically, if you look at the bottom applicator gun, um, this is one of the ones that we use for the intranasal vaccine. So uh, you can see there's the applicator gun uh, in green. The bottle fits in the in the top there, and then the little green um, cap which says MSD on it. That's that's all in one piece. So um, the nozzle is quite short. The, uh, the round bit stops you from shoving it too deep in the nose. Um, and it just means that you can administer that vaccine without, uh, I've never heard of them snapping. So I, I do not um, think that this would snap. So if you're having problems with things snapping, I would suggest you try a different applicator. Um, and those nozzles can be put in the uh, dishwasher or just in boiling water to clean them. So you don't need to throw them away after uh, use, they can be reused. So just make sure if you are using, and then the top one, that's a that's a gun used for injectable vaccination. So um, that's where, again, you put the bottle in the top and that's got the steromatic on it. And um, you then use that for injectable vaccination. So if you're going to use these, just make sure you keep them clean, dry, in good working order. Um, you'd be amazed the number of people who spend thousands of pounds or hundreds of pounds on a vaccine and they're using the same dirty applicator that they've used for, for 10 years but that's never been cleaned. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to be putting a, a sterile vaccine into the animal, you want to make sure that your applicator is also clean and sterile um, to, to, to make sure that's going to work as best as possible. Uh, and it shouldn't need to say to read the leaflet, but <laughs> I'm sure many people don't read the leaflet, um, particularly if you've done it before, but sometimes things can change. Uh, different uh, vaccines can be given in different ways and so always do read the leaflet because it does uh, we, we, you know it, it's there to tell you how to do it um, and, and it better to, to read it and spend five minutes than having to revaccinate the whole herd of animals because you've done something wrong and, and please mix the pellet with the liquid <laughs> don't, don't inject yes. the liquid and throw the pellet oh God, in the bin. that, that, that has that. happened yes yeah. it has I mean, we've had some people ringing us up being like, oh, I injected them all with the liquid. Now I have all the pellets. Do you have some more liquid ones on their own so I can do it all again? <laughs> so, yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> the pellet is actually the vaccine. The liquid is just water, basically. So that's not going to do anything. <laughs> um, yeah. And then um, on the next slide, we've got uh, just some pictures of fridges. So uh, I can't claim uh, responsibility for this study, but one of my colleagues actually went round in the southwest and um, took photos and measured the temperatures over a six month period of um, a wide range of farm fridges that were on actual farms where vaccines were stored in them. So these are two of the two of the, the offenders, I should say. Um, but uh, in that study, he basically found that none of the fridges that he measured over a period of six months maintained the correct temperature during the whole six month period. And some of the fridges actually were not at the correct temperature any of the time. Um, so 
vaccines do need to be stored between generally between two and eight degrees centigrade. Um, if they are frozen, they will be inactivated because the proteins will denature. If they are get, if they get hot, the same thing will happen. Um, so if they're not in the fridge, say if you need to take them somewhere to just vaccinate the animals, recommend putting them in a cool box, particularly if it's a hot day. I know we're not having that problem at the moment, but in the summer we will do. Um, and uh, yeah, if we just look at these pictures of the fridges, so the one on the left, you can see that probably is from uh, about the 1970s and um, was not working as a fridge. It was it was just a cupboard basically. So, uh, and you can see there are vaccines in that fridge. The one on the right, there's a massive block of ice at the top and that was um, the vaccines are right below it if you can if you've got good eyesight you can see them uh, so those were frozen and they wouldn't have done, um, done any good <laughs> to anyone so these are th this is really something i think to um go and you know go and have a look at your own farm fridge buy a um, a temperature monitor if you don't have one they're pretty cheap from amazon um ensure that nobody plugs and unplugs the fridge if you must, you can take all of your food out of your um, home fridge and put the vaccines in there because they're worth more than your groceries. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, yeah. And this is just the next slide. It's just um, the uh, one of the examples of the fridges that was the worst example, I'll say, but one of the examples of the, of the fridges that was um, monitored during the study. So uh, no fridge maintained the correct temperature. 59% of fridges recorded temperatures over 8 degrees centigrade. 53 recorded temperatures under two degrees centigrade, 41% recorded temperatures under um, freezing, so they would have frozen their vaccines. So yeah, it's quite an eye-opening um, bit of work here. And this graph on the right basically just shows the temp temperature of the fridge compared to the temperature of the ambient um, of the environment. So um, what we're seeing here is that the fridge is the same temperature as the environment. So the fridge is basically just a cupboard, it's not doing anything. So that's my fridges rant. Um, and I think I'm coming to the end of my bit. So yeah, um, in summary, uh, I think this is maybe Nick's slide. <laughs> do you want to do, talk about yes, this one, Nick? It is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was, I was going to happily chat on, but... <laughs> no, please do, please do. <laughs> uh, there are calves are under many challenges to their immune status during the rearing process. So we've been through quite a few of them. Not in as much detail as I'm sure we could go into, but we've only got limited time. Um, certainly nutrition and, and environment need to be optimised. I think we can go on about this um, for, for, for longer and longer. And there are more webinars on this in this series about these, which is really good. Um, vaccination works. Thanks, Nick. That's, that's good to know. And uh, has a place in improving immune status. Uh, and many options are available. So, uh, yeah, as much as I'd like to say come and use ours, uh, particularly for, for pneumonia, I know that the most important thing is to find the right vaccine for your farm. Um, and it is about delivering it properly. Uh, managing the challenges on your farms using the right vaccine according to what you diagnose and also for the right animals so looking to see when the disease is occurring and giving the vaccine well before that that period but yeah i might pass back to nick if he's got any other comments on that yeah no that was that was it really to summarize um yeah and and then really opening us up for any questions that that, that are remaining tom yeah, and, and there, there definitely are some questions remaining. So um, I'm going to put those to you now, and I don't mind if either or if both of you answer those questions. What is the best way to clean a live vaccine gun? Okay, yeah, no. Um, so what we try not to encourage is use of disinfectants, because um, in the case of some live vaccines, they could... Um, residues of the, of the disinfectant could remain in the gun and, and inactivate the vaccine. So uh, I we often say just to immerse the gun in um, hot warm water with um, you can use fairy liquid, say um, that's fine um, and operate it to, to pass the water through and then rinse it really well. So that, that's 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 perfectly acceptable way of cleaning it. Um, and is there a way of, of cleaning between animals without effect in the vaccine um so there yes you can use the steromatic um if you can get hold of it so that that's basically a cap which has got a bit of a disinfectant in it but unfortunately they uh, um took it off the market earlier this year uh and it it may or may not come back it's unfortunately not made by us so we don't have control over that um you do want to change your needle regularly. So um, if the needle is becoming blunt or broken or bent, um, you definitely want to change it regularly. 
you, you can just wipe the needle um and I, i'm i'm a sort of i think if the animals aren't outwardly dirty you shouldn't need to do that so um i think you just have to be as long as you're vaccinating in a, in a kind of careful way and you're not you're not leaving the needle sitting on the side and gathering dust and things like that um you shouldn't need to do that um but some people do i know wipe it with either cotton wool or cotton wool soaked in spirit um I don't know if Nick has got an opinion on that one. It's, I, I, I think the main thing is just not to vaccinate animals that are really dirty and to make sure the needle is, is changed regularly. Those would be my main um, points on, on needles. Yeah, same really. And whether that, the, that person was asking a question, maybe alluding to any chemicals that might interfere with live vaccines. Yeah. Um, we you know have had people using stereomatics for um, administration of live vaccines and ha hasn't interfered with you know control it's of disease. Stereomatic doesn't seem to. Um, the, only, no. the only vaccine that, that would is the scabby vax which is for ORF because that is a very sensitive live vaccine. It's not called scabby, it's called scabby guard now we don't we don't sell it anymore but um, other live vaccines don't seem to be affected by the stereomatic so that um, seems to be fine but the problem with surgical spirit I think it's a very similar thing but it, yeah I don't I don't say I couldn't say oh it's it, it definitely won't affect live vaccines if you see what I mean no and we we are running dangerously close to running out of time but I think some of these questions mm. are really good I'm gonna I'm gonna take a liberty and, and go over ever so slightly if that's okay um what is the best way to test for disease to help us decide which vaccine to use so this is a really good question um we have lots of different testing modalities in our arsenal. The, um, in terms of the acute outbreak situation, where well, we potentially got, um, you know, dead animals, the post-mortem is, is by far the most powerful. Um, and testing the, you know, t samples of lung for histology, um, and then potentially samples of lung for um, for looking for the virus, the, the, the presence of the virus. That offers us the most clarity in terms of um, in terms of causative pathogens. Um, there are there's a bit of a caveat to that in that when we have you have an outbreak, often calves that have been sick before or calves with long-standing bacterial pneumonia can appear to be new cases. Um, so we need to make sure that we, we, we get a nice acute, genuinely acute case. Um, but post-mortem is, is, is probably our most valuable um, mode of diagnosis. The other things that we have, um, we have uh, blood testing. So we can do a blood test looking for um, an increase in antibody response and that's quite a good indicator of, of the various things that have been involved um, and we also have um, uh, swabs so pharynge deep, pharynge deep pharyngeal swabs which we are guarded so they go through the nose and then they go into the back basically to the back of the calf's mouth to take the sample and those are another way of um, of looking for pathogens there is a, uh, you do have to be careful of how you interpret those swabs. Um, you will often find um, a lot of the, the common pathogens in terms of the bacteria will be in the back of the calf's mouth. Whether or not that's implicated in the current condition or not is, is, is not always easy to, um, to be sure of. And then there's a, a method that is, is often not commonly done, but is actually quite useful. Um, which is called a BAL, so a bronchoalveolar lavage, where we you basically introduce a small amount of um, fluid into the lungs and then you suck it out again, and that tells you in the in the acute cases um, quite accurately where what viruses are present. Um, so that that has a place in terms of um, making a diagnosis without having a dead calf. Um, so there's lots of different ways and it, it, it it's not again it's this back to this bovine respiratory disease complex it's it's an it's a complex thing but personally i think if you're having lots of challenges and the picture seems to be um seems to be similar between calves then actually 
And if we're talking about investing in vaccination protocols and potentially improvements in management, um, then post-mortem is definitely a, um, is probably your best route of getting an answer. Um, although it requires the sacrifice of an animal, it will provide us with the most information. Yeah, making sure okay, you send well. the fresh, the animal fresh as well, because we do get that sometimes where people are sort of, they're sending in samples which are a few days old and the, the interpretation is not so easy with yeah. those. So making sure it's a fresh sample is, is very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, and in the interest of time, and sincere apologies if we haven't got to your questions, there have been an awful lot that have been sent in today. Um, so one last question, do the rotavirus stroke coronavirus vaccines given to pre-calving cows protect calves from respiratory disease? Um, no is the answer, unfortunately, as, as much as I'd love to say yes. So um, yeah, you're giving the, the cow the, the rotavirus coronavirus E. coli, she produces antibodies to that vaccine, those go into her colostrum, the calf suckles that colostrum and it basically protects the lining of the um, enteric tract so those antibodies don't really pass through into the respiratory tract so um, uh, and Nick did mention respiratory coronavirus earlier uh, if an animal is um, a calf is getting colostrum from a, a cow that's been vaccinated for coronavirus they still potentially could get respiratory coronavirus because that isn't um, that protection isn't necessarily given from the colostrum so slightly frustrating um, I know um, but yeah, it's, it, it, that is how it is. Thanks very much. And I think to, to wrap up, what would be really good is if you could both give me your, your key take home messages that you want people to uh, go away with from this session, um, which way they can implement either this year or put into planning for next year to help with their pneumonia protocols. Um, from my perspective, uh, just optimizing nutrition is, is so important. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of these pathogens are present on most farms. Beef from dairy rearing places will have them all. Um, optimizing nutrition is, is why, or why we don't see disease. So, and, and, and then also thinking about the protocols and, and the process the calf goes through concentrating on that. I think for me it would be like focusing on that calf as soon as it's born so really the first few days of life being your kind of key golden time to get it right um, making sure that colostrum is given properly making sure you've you know thought about the vaccines it's going to need and given those um, putting it in the right um, environment not moving it too many times so just really the, the first few days and weeks of life uh, it's going to affect the rest of its whole life so if you can get those right you, you'll be on to a winner so that would be my my message really well thank you both very much and also a big thank you to the team from AHDB that's been working in the background to make these webinars happen um, remember this is part of a wider series um, so if this has piqued your interest and you've not seen any of the others then have a look on our website for links to the recordings and get registered for those coming up next week because we're continuing next week as well um, You'll receive an email with a link to the recording from this webinar and also any resources. Thank you very much for joining. I hope you found it useful um, and hopefully we will see you online or face to face again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.